Thank you, James, and I'm very, very pleased to be here. Thank you all for coming out, and as James said, it's such a nice night. My, um, my, the title I chose for my presentation tonight was Nantucket, a front row seat for climate change. I didn't realize that if you've been sitting here in these seats, you really would have had a front row seat for some flooding from climate change-induced uh, floods. Uh, but I'll get to that in a second. What I'd like to do is tell you a little bit more about the Center for Coastal Studies. As you can see, we are a, uh, a private, nonprofit scientific research, education, and policy organization. Our goal is to provide objective scientific data to decision makers to enable them to make the best decisions that would conserve and protect ocean and coastal resources. And decision makers are people in government, people in business, and all of us, because collectively we make decisions every day that impact the fate and future of the oceans. We, we are not a pure research organization. We, we do what we like to call science that matters, science that will be practically used for making decisions to solve problems or provide solutions to problems that affect all of us. So you can see the range of activities uh, that we do uh, from water quality to sea level rise and, and land and shoreline change, uh, a whole range of, of, of options, basically an ecological approach to our studies. You may know us mostly if you've seen us in the headlines or in any story on television or in a newspaper, because one of our most um, important functions is to disentangle endangered whales at sea. So our jurisdiction uh, in our permit given to us by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, enables us to approach endangered whales, including the most endangered of all whales, the North Atlantic right whale, uh, in, in order to provide, uh, an, at least make an attempt, to free them from entanglements. And this is what we do. You can see our, our small vessel out there. Eventually, these folks will get in this, even a smaller zodiac. And when the whale is tired and slowed down a little bit, actually using some of the techniques that the original whalers did here in, in Nantucket, uh, instead of putting the Nantucket slave ride keg tied behind the whale to slow it down, tire it out, we put a buoy, a big buoy. And instead of using a harpoon to stick it, to kill it, we take the tip of the, har of the harpoon and turn it around so it's almost like a limb cutter. And we can, if we can get it be uh, underneath the rope that's entangling the, or the line that's entangling the whale and yank on it, we can often free the whale from a painful, slow, long death. So um, that's one of the activities. And this is the, uh, the reason why the North Atlantic right whale tends to get itself in trouble more times than not because they're very strange looking animals. Uh, that's their baleen you can see right up, right here. This is, this is six, seven feet high, major piece of its, it is, it's, in, it's in its mouth, but it just glides through the surface of the water eating microscopic copepods, little phy phytoplankton, zooplankton. Oh, these are phytoplankton, actually. And, and they um, will ingest as many as 1,000 pounds a day when they're feeding. And they feed in Cape Cod Bay uh, mostly during January through May, that's their primary feeding ground, and of the 450 total animals that are left in the world, we had 251 of them sighted and identified by their markings, each, each marking's individual. Our scientists know them by, by name and by, by markings. So we have a great chance to study them and to save them when we can. But as they're gliding through the top of the water, basically in ecstasy eating tons and tons of copepods, they often encounter line from a fishing pot or a lobster pot. And that's why they're endangered to a certain degree. Um, one other thing on whales before I get to the climate change topic, this is uh, not the greatest photograph, but this is a shot of a recently hung 37 foot skeleton of a humpback whale in our building in Provincetown. We're a small facility, but we managed to, in our renovation, carve out a, a big enough space to hang this, and we're about to become more of a public mini whaling museum, very modest compared to the great work that is done here. 
But uh, as James mentioned, with the partnership, we're hoping to build more of an exchange of information. But this particular skeleton, it's going to be hard to see. Well, you can see it. Here's the line that it was entangled. And we saved it three times over an 11-year period. Our guys went out in that little boat, cut hundreds of feet of line and buoys and lobster traps at one point off it. A few years later, it was reported entangled again, again and again. We were never able to get this line out of its mouth. And the reason is it's hard to see, but inside, the line had been become embedded in the roof bone of its mouth. Because that line, at one point, extended back two or 300 feet with eight or 10 lobster pots. And every time it dove, the lobster pots, the, the, str the stress of the pots, basically carved the line into its mouth. Painful, long, excruciating death. When we finally found it after it had died, we embedded it, um, buried it in you know, the dirt. That's how you cleanse it. And, uh, and then when we dug it up, we realized the entanglement was still there. So when you come to visit us in Provincetown, I invite you all to do that, and you'll walk in, you'll see a very dramatic teaching moment of how 300,000 marine mammals die every year around the world, entanglement in fishing line. So that's, um, that's one of our missions. But I'm here tonight to talk about another very serious issue, one that does have an impact on whales, and that's the climate change, uh, the, uh, uh, climate warming and uh, change. Uh, and one thing about this is I believe the science is pretty well settled. I mean, there's never a final settlement of science. Science is always the art of learning more. But the debate about whether or not the climate is warming is definitely over. Uh, I had the good pleasure, the distinct honor, of being in Paris for the climate change discussions in 2015. And at that point, the 197 leaders of the world's nations who were there knew, didn't go back to debate whether or not climate was really warming. We went forward on how to, how to save it. But I will show you one quick chart. And this is uh, referred to as the hockey stick curve. Uh, I've played hockey all my life, and so I like this particular way to demonstrate trends. But if you were to um, measure almost any kind of change that's relevant to the climate, like the average temperature of the surface of the ocean, the average temperature of the planet, the amount of carbon dioxide that we're emitting into the atmosphere, any of those parameters stayed pretty much steady. Now, these are yearly fluctuations, and sometimes there's a dramatic fluctuation and so forth since over the past 1,000 years. But starting right about the Industrial Revolution, 1850, you can see the line starts to trend upward. And the blue information, the blue data, is stuff we had to extrapolate from the core rings of trees or ice cores, but the red data is actual data from thermometers, things we know and can trust. And this, you would note, stops at 2000. But the last 17 years, this is continuing right up like that. And as far as we know, unless dramatic action is taken globally, that trend will continue. So that's the challenge of climate change. What happened in Paris, I think, was probably I'm hoping a turning point, a pivotal moment when 196 presidents came together, not to stop the climate from warming, because that's impossible now. We've put too much in motion, but to slow the rate of climate change. That's our hope, and we can do it, we believe. And when 196 presidents came together and spent almost two weeks, or at least their, their, their emissaries did, hammering out a 29-page agreement, it was pretty monumental. Never before has happened. Uh, and so I think that gives us a lot of hope. One little fun story, by the way. Uh, this was in Paris, big conference hall. But each of the presidents wanted to give an introductory statement. So do the math. Even if you limit them to three minutes, which the organizers finally did, times 196 presidents and prime ministers, they finally decided the UN organizers put them in two different rooms, gave them three minutes each, and then just turned through. So by the end of the first day, all the official statements had been made. But here's what they settled on. This is the, this is the really the important thing for um, Paris. A global target was set. So if we do nothing, if we do business as usual in that last 
hockey stick curve that I showed you continues to trend upward, we'll end up at 2100 with the average temperature of the Earth four degrees Celsius warmer than it was at the at the um, at, at the industrial at the 1900. All right. The United Nations says, let's try to take action globally to limit the increase in the average temperature of the Earth to only 2 degrees Celsius. See, 2 degrees Celsius, by the way, that's 3.6 Fahrenheit. So going this way, that's about seven, over 7 degrees warmer Fahrenheit. That's really, really significant. So that's where we, that's the shooting. And, and the reason Paris was successful, even though leaders, global leaders, had come together 20 times before that, without getting to an agreement, was because this time, for the first time, they made it voluntary. So every country came and said, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. We're going to plant a million uh, acres of, of, of trees in, in Siberia to reduce carbon dioxide. Whatever it was, it was accepted. And that, that, um, that means that we probably are going to get close. Well, here's the, here are the commitments. We're going to get, we're going to get close, but not hit that two degrees target by 2100. We knew that. But the, 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 the genius of Paris was, let's get started. Let's get 196 countries in the game. The best thing that happened at the end of the conference was all the leaders agreed to come together in five more years. That's 2020 already. And they know they're going to have to up the ante and the commitment to actually hit that goal. And I hope the political will is still be there. There's actually 195 presidents now, not 196, I'm sorry to say. But the other 195 are committed and moving forward tremendously. So that's, um, that's the, the stage setting. That's the, the target. But why are we concerned about it besides the future of the planet? Well, oceans and climate are inextricably linked. Uh, and people hopefully remember some of this from your high school biology classes. But 50% of the oxygen we're breathing in this room right now is produced in the ocean, right? Not just from, not from the, the rainforest, which produces a lot, but in the top few millimeters are phytoplankton, plants that do photosynthesis, that produce, carbon di uh, produce oxygen, take in carbon dioxide. I mean, it is, that's a pretty strong connection. The, the oceans have sequestered, or taken in about 50% of all of the excess carbon dioxide that we've produced since the Industrial Revolution in 1850. They drive our weather systems. We had front row seats for that here in Nantucket Harbor this past winter. They provide a major portion of our world's protein, and on and on and on. So we have to, st I always start to start with that to remind people that there's a big connection between oceans and climate. In, in, in my other organization called the Global Ocean Forum has been showing up at the climate change meetings for the last 15 to 20 years because the climatologists didn't always themselves recognize that connection. So we had to try to work hard to get oceans on the international agenda, and we finally did, and there's language in the Paris Accord that says oceans are important, and we have to take steps to reduce the, the rate of, ocean, of climate change in order to save oceans. So the other problem we've faced over the years with oceans is that the attitude from societies over generations have thought they're just too big to fail. And I coined this, uh, this says after the bank failure, put it, made it popular, but it applies to oceans as well. You know, we've always thought we can take as much fish out of the, as many whales as we wanted to out of the ocean and they'd always be more, no. Take as much fish as we want, no. And we also thought, let's dispose of all our waste there, whether it's radioactive or just sewage from New York City, no. That has not worked. We need to realize that, and we also know that science is showing us that they are failing in many ways. So what are some of the ways that uh, the uh, climate change is impacting oceans? Well, clearly the average temperature is rising. Acidity has increased. Sea levels are rising. Habitats are shifting. I'll come back to these in a minute. And ocean currents are beginning to change and potentially could be a tipping point for many changes that we don't want to see, and weather events are clearly intensifying. Why did I talk about the front row seat? Well, it's not exactly off of Nantucket, but not too far from here in the Gulf of Maine. Right? You know, that's the area between Cape Cod and Canada, that big body of water. That is where 
the surface of the ocean is warming faster than any other spot in the world. So one thing to understand is climate change is not happening uh, in a homogenous way around the world. It's varying depending upon all kinds of other factors. But in that spot, it's increasing. So all of the attendant results of climate change from oceans warming, we're going to feel in the northeast United States, including here. One of those impacts, one of those changes, as I mentioned earlier, is ocean acidification. When carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere from power, our, our major sources, power plants, transportation, heating our homes, when we put too much into the atmosphere, which we've been doing since 18, 19, 1850s, the, and the atmosphere cannot absorb it, not, not handle it, and it exceeds ambient levels in the atmosphere, then it precipitates out into the oceans. So when CO2 precipitates out and hits the ocean, the CO2 molecule combines with an O2, another, another, mark, another oxygen molecule, and becomes CO3, which is carbonic acid. That's why the oceans are acidifying. That's why coral reefs are dying. That's why shellfish, lobsters, even in this area, maybe are starting to take on a model look because some of their shells that are calcium are, cal are not calcifying as well. So we have a whole potential system. This, way, this is not, does not get a lot of public attention, but ocean acidification may be one of the most serious threats we have from our climate change, our changing climate. Another interesting one, I think is interesting, but it's causing some not only environmental change, but economic and societal changes. Codfish live in habitats that basically have a certain range of water temperature. So as the temperature has warmed off the coast of southeast New England and George's Bank, they've moved on. Some, some portion of the cod population have moved further north and further offshore. And interestingly, when over the years, I, I was the Assistant Secretary of Environmental Affairs, and we had a lot of really controversial controversial issues with fishermen, and the accusation was always, well, you guys, you fishermen are taking too many fish, you're exceeding your quotas. Some of the fishermen would say in return, maybe we're doing that, but there's something else going on. The codfish just aren't where they used to be. They've moved. And upon further scientific investigation, it turns out they were right. The codfish have shifted their habitat, as will many other orga organisms. The other interesting or another phenomenon, another worry maybe, is that as sea level rises and it begins to move further onto the land, in particularly where there are salt marsh areas, if you, if you remember there, or if you should know, there are two different kinds of salt marsh. Low line, which has a certain kind of vegetation, which is Spartina alterniflora, in the little higher area where Spartina patens, there's two different kinds of salt marsh grasses. You may not be able to tell them apart driving by in your car, but they require a different habitat. Well, historically, over time, as sea level is rising gradually and change the habitat, those vegetated areas just moved further inland and up a little higher to higher ground. But now, where we have roads and dikes and paved parking lots, that natural succession of the habitat back inland cannot happen. So consequently, these numbers are from Cape Cod National Seashore. These are three major marshes. And look how much of the upper highland marsh has been lost just since 1984. So that's a, a, another significant habitat change that's being caused. We know, and I'll talk a little bit more later about sea level rise and erosion rates accelerating, um, again, in many parts of the world, but because of that extra warming of the ocean here in the Northeast, we're gonna have the front row seat for accelerated uh, increases of rates. And coming back to the whales just for a moment, um, the, uh, I mentioned the entanglements, and for the longest time, we were concerned about the future of endangered species because of two threats, the entanglement or getting hit by ships. And so a lot of our management activity was focused on slowing ships during critical areas or in Boston Harbor actually getting the International Maritime Organization 
to shift the shipping lane away from the primary feeding ground, just about three miles, but it made a big difference. That's all been good and has helped some of the species come back. But now, potentially, I suggest that climate change, changing the ability of these small copepods to live in Cape Cod Bay may be a more of a systemic threat by eliminating or reducing the food supply, not for just one or two whales that are getting tangled, but for the entire species. So climate change actually may be, may be more of a threat than, than chips and, and ropes. And I won't go into all of these, but when you're involved in climate change issues like in Paris and in an international level, you get to think about some of these other things. Uh, they're not necessarily environmental. Well, yes, they are. Uh, health and human impacts from climate change. You know that certain viruses and, and species, malaria, for example, is being found further north, coming up from the tropical latitudes, up this way as temperatures warm. That's an issue for us. It's a health issue. The num for the last three or four secretaries of state, the number one security issue for that administration had been climate change. Because climate change has a way of flooding low-lying areas, right? like in Bangladesh or in some of the African countries, where millions of people will be and have already been displaced, causing social stress to the society, to the governing group, which causes potential upheaval in the government, which creates an opportunity for terrorists and other governments to take over. So the secretary, the, I, I'm not sure what the priority is for the secretary of state now, honestly, haven't read the report, but up until this point, climate change was considered a number one threat to our security. Not only for those reasons I mentioned, but for food, food security. If populations can't grow food because their, their areas are becoming deserts, that causes other kinds of disruptions. Um, trillions of dollars of economic impacts. Uh, right now, in the United States alone, we have many trillions of dollars of infrastructure in New York City, Miami, San Francisco, Boston, Nantucket Harbor that are going to be jeopardized, will need to be moved, relocated, rebuilt, or something in order to adapt to this change. So lots of things, uh, including, you know, I threw in the psycho psychology adjustments. Uh, I, I often give talks, I, was, I actually teach a course at Wellesley College, and I mention some of this stuff, and I of, often see the young, um, well, women in this case, looking at this, like, what does my future hold? You know, is it, is it is everything you're telling me, Delaney, is scary. Um, should I get married, should I have kids? And, and, and I have to catch myself and say, it's not the end of the world. It's going to be a dramatic, could be a dra dramatically different world. But if we take some action now, we can begin to adapt to a much more moderate change than some of this most scary stuff that we put up here. So uh, you have to be careful about the psychological impact of this stuff. So what's ahead? Well, when the, when the 196 world leaders come back to Paris in 2020, I believe they're gonna to have to put a price on carbon. It was a technique that was discussed in Paris, but it was just too controversial for some. But since then, 40 countries have begun to do that. This is basically the good of the economics of the marketplace. You know, if you produce something that's gonna have carbon dioxide spin-off and an external cost, that should be priced into the cost of your fuel gallon of gasoline. Right? right now, we don't pay for those external costs. But if we start to do that in our economic system, it will have a way of increasing renewable energy and decreasing other things that use and produce a lot of carbon dioxide. We're going to have to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. Uh, one of the reasons we, I believe, are in this predicament with fossil fuels just dominating is that governments around the world, including our government, provide a total each year of about $650 billion to oil and gas companies. And they make big profits even without this. But that's the kind of control they've had over our, love, our, over our governance process and our government policies. That really needs to shift from fossil fuel to renewable fuel or just not have it at all. And already, the cost of solar and wind power is now competitive 
with the price of fossil fuels, oil and gas, and even natural gas. So it's, the marketplace is moving in the right direction. We just have to make the government policies follow suit. So let's come zero down from Paris and global discussions to what's happening here in Nantucket. Um, obviously an island, obviously with a lot of sandy shores, Medicate, where, where my, my sister Arlene lives, has been, she's been showing me the, the, the dramatic changes there for years. You've had the first um, flooding here in, this, in, the, in the harbor. But the basic thing, what, what people need to do, and this Nantucket does as well, is try to figure out ways to adapt and prepare for what could be two to seven feet rise in sea level by 2100. So think about it. I, I don't want to give you a whole lot of numbers, but the general consensus is, based on facts, that sea level has risen about 10 inches in the last century. So that's about an inch a decade, okay? But that wasn't an equal rate for the last 100 years. It started and it's been accelerating, as that hockey chart graph showed you. So we have to anticipate that at least doubling, just based on the rate that we've already seen. So that would give us almost two feet guaranteed without anything changing. But we also know that we've put incredible amounts of carbon dioxide in the air, the temperature is continuing, so it's likely to be considerably more than two. Two is very, very conservative. Maybe three or four. Most, pe most planners are talking about trying to avoid going to four feet average sea level. This is, again, average around the world. More in some places, less elsewhere. However, I put the asterisks there because there are a couple of wild cards at play. One is if at the ice sheets in Antarctica and or the Arctic Ocean continue to melt in such a way that they literally slide off the land and into the ocean. It would be more like a tipping point moment and would, in a very relatively short period of time, raise the sea level rise another three or four feet. Under that scenario, seven is still conservative. The, the International Panel for Climate Change, 8,000 scientists who have been looking at this from different ways, under different methodologies around the world, who really are the, the final say, I believe, in this, uh, have used numbers like 10, 12 feet rise in sea level. Not maybe in 2100, but 2150, two, 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 you know, a couple hundred years. But it's going in that direction. Hopefully our grandkids and great-grandkids and great-grandkids will be here. But that's, that's what we have to plan for. That's the challenge. So uh, I'm just sort of getting ready to, to share some thoughts with you. I looked at some literature, and uh, one of your colleagues here, Sarah Trainer Bois, boys, I guess, at uh, the Linda Loring Nature Foundation, uh, did a recent article. You may have seen it in the, in the paper. Uh, and it shows that Nantucket actually is doing a lot to get ready for climate change. Here are three steps you've already taken in 2013. Worked with the National Weather Service to um, at least develop an emergency response system, redundant um, um, emergency re re response procedures. Then in 19, 2014, uh, coastal's, coastal management plan was developed by my old colleagues at the Urban Harbor Institute, along with your uh, folks here, Dave Franzuto and others, to evaluate your town infrastructure and make some recommendations. One of the recommendations they made then was to put that extra high bulkhead right down here on Easy Street and put in some, some culverts that will let any water that comes over go back into the ocean. There are more of that, more of that needs to be done. And then some clever students from uh, Worcester Polytechnical Institute identified some other infrastructure. So uh, you've taken some good steps. I think probably more than most communities that I meet, have a chance to talk with and, and deal with. So good for you on that. And then in 2015, uh, my group, the Center for Coastal Studies, worked directly with your town to do this project called, uh, long title, Empowering Coastal Communities to Prepare for the Response to Sea Level Rise and Storm-Related Inundation, a pilot project for Nantucket. Now, Governor Baker and his uh, Coastal Zone Management Office have been giving grants the last few years to towns to figure out ways to prepare for that two to seven feet rise in sea level. And so we teamed with your town government here 
to identify what we call storm tide pathways. We went out, we mapped the entire coastline of Nantucket, and we didn't just look for low areas by, this is five feet above sea, or below, five feet above, this is six feet, this is seven feet. We looked for the vulnerable spot, that little area that you might not notice, that even with only a three foot rise in, in sea level, the water could come in and actually find its way around and flood a portion of the town. This happened in Provincetown just last, last winter. We made a prediction, we said, don't worry about all this here, that's a little avenue, and if it gets to be more than 11 feet, sure enough, as soon as it hit 11 feet, the, the tide came right down onto Main Street, it's called Commercial Street, went down the street and into the basement of the town hall, just as predicted. All it would have taken was a bunch of sandbags at the end of that little sand street, rather than any big deal. But, so we learned a tough lesson there, but uh, next time they'll be prepared. So hopefully this works. We, um, we tried to first to identify the storm tide pathways from our desks back at, in Provincetown, just using global, global Google, Google Maps and other satellite images. And we, we found a number of them. And then we came out here and actually went out and did some physical measuring with LIDAR and, and uh, survey equipment. And we found that based on, it's gonna be hard to read some of this, but these, co these colors are correspond with this um, rise in sea level, right? So we can tell your DPW director, if you see and measure a, an eight, or let's see, a six to 6.4 rise in sea level, storm surge, here are, we have the right colors, here are your most vulnerable spots. If it goes up here, you've got some other spots. So this is really fine-tuned information um, that, that we find are, we're finding as we've done this for the towns, that is practical information that would help towns make the right investment to deal with adapting those particular spots. And we find, of course, the most of them are congregated right outside this door or in Medicaid, and you knew that just from your lives out here. So that's the kind of uh, work we've been trying to do. Hopefully it's going to be helpful. There's more to be done, but this should guide uh, future adaptation states, state, uh, uh, actions here in, uh, in, Prov in, in uh, Nantucket. So I don't want to talk all night. I'd rather engage in some Q&A. Uh, I'll just end by, well, I guess this was on, I was supposed to show this too. Here's, here's what I mean by, you, if you just looked at the elevation, you get six, this is seven area, this is, in, but when you start to add the water, you can see it doesn't necessarily be, it's not one steady stream from the ocean into the land. It can come from different ways. If you just did it by looking at the total elevation, you get that kind of a map. And you've probably seen these in newspapers, but that doesn't tell you enough. That doesn't tell you the pathway where that water's coming. You see? So that's the, uh, that's the, we'd be happy to come back. I know we'll be doing some more work. Our boat will be in Nantucket Harbor. Uh, our other boat will be in Nantucket Harbor in August because we're going to be providing for the town a map of the bottom of Nantucket Harbor, a seafloor map that will show you in high resolution where your eelgrass beds are, where your shellfish beds are, how thick and rich the eelgrass is, where the sand deposits are, what kind of sand, is it gravel, is it salt? And, uh, and towns are finding that incredibly useful. So we'll be back out here, and I'll hopefully, if you share your cards or send me an email, I'll let you know when we're coming, and be happy to see you then, too. So that's it. Um, I will end by mentioning when I came back from Paris, a lot of people asked, what can people do? So on Cape Cod, we've joined together and formed a thing we call the Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative. Just a lot of citizens and businesses and schools and churches all voluntarily, come, voluntarily coming together saying, Here's what we'll do to help reduce our amount of carbon dioxide on the Cape. If you want to look at our website, you can learn more about it. It might be an idea that Nantucketers want to uh, embrace as well. So happy to answer questions. Thank you for your attention. appreciate you being here tonight. Did I scare anybody? Oh, good. Questions?
Yeah. Uh, we, we pride ourselves on being collaborative. That we can't do all this stuff by ourselves. No organization can. So we do collaborate with Solar Oceanographic. We do a lot of collaboration with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration around um, endangered species. We also now are working closely with the Barnstable County and the state legislature or State Department of Environmental Protection on doing water quality testing in Cape Cod Bay in Nantucket Sound. And we've been doing that for about 15 years. We have 150 sites that we monitor very carefully for a whole lot of parameters. That data is being used by Cape Cod towns right now to develop a comprehensive wastewater management plan because Cape Codders have found out that the nitrogen from their septic systems, their, even their Title V approved septic systems, is not treated and it goes into the groundwater, it goes into the local bays and harbors and, 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 and marshes, and it eutrophies, it speeds up the, uh, the growth of algae, and it's killing shellfish beds, and it's really causing a big environmental problem. And for Cape Codders, and it would be the same thing here, it's causing an economic problem because we thrive on tourism. And if our beaches, continue to be clogged with green mat mats of green algae, we're going to be hurting economically. So the group that has been, that we collaborate with in this, is actually leading the charge, is the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce. Believe it or not, they've raised their hand and said, this is a big problem. We know it's going to cost $4 billion to clean up over a long period of time. But we're willing to pay that price because we have many, many billions of dollars of investment in our economy, too. So that's a little ex example of some of the range of, of um, groups we, we team with. Other questions? Yes, sir. James. Yeah. We, we will be much better answer, able to answer that question after we get a real good understanding of the bathymetry, how much has silted into the harbor, what kind of material it is. It does play, a, a, it does impact the energy of waves coming across the harbor. Um, a, a variation of this, so, so I, I can't answer your question right now, but I will be able to at the end of August, I hope, if you invite me back. Um, but on a larger scale, another theory that our coastal geologists are, are, are thinking about is, you know, the outer, outer arm of Cape Cod has had some dramatic erosion over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, that's our fastest eroding coastline, like yours is off of Madiket. And of course, you know, waves are the mechanism that drive up against the sand and help erode it. Waves are basically wind-driven, are, are manifestations of the energy of the wind. So as winds whip across the ocean, that energy is transformed into waves. There are other, I'm simplifying it, there are other factors, obviously. But that drives the wave. So if you put a, an underwater barrier outside of your harbor, or if you put a barrier, you obviously dissipate the wave. But even if you put a barrier like a coral reef or something that's just underneath the surface of the ocean, the wave energy that's not seen on the surface in the form of a wave, but is also being carried below the water, is dissipated. Okay? So if you understand that, now think about waves coming across the Atlantic Ocean. 
going across the top of George's Bank, which is basically an underwater barrier. It's a plateau. Deeper water on one side, deeper on the inside, but it slows down and dissipates some of, or removes, we believe, some of the energy of those ocean waves that are coming across the Atlantic hitting on the Cape and Nantucket. With climate change and sea level rise, just even the eight inches in the last century, more of that wave energy is going across the top of George's Bank and bringing more force onto the mainland, is our hypothesis. And it sounds a little bit far out there, but we're talking about global systems, and this could very well be one of the interesting factors that has increased the force and intensity of wave-driven, storm-driven erosion. So there'll be more on that, too, coming up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, uh, this is a question is, uh, what about, can we learn lessons from Holland? Basically, a lot of their country is below sea level. Uh, they've done some amazing engineering over there, the life of that country, and a lot of cities particularly are looking to Holland for lessons learned. So right now, New York City is entertaining the potent possibility of building a massive, storm, what they call a storm surge barrier across the entire mouth of Hudson River. Um, billions of dollars, all kinds of impacts. It's controversial, but what's at risk is about 427,000 people who live in the low-lying areas around Manhattan and another $50 billion worth of infra infrastructure in Manhattan alone. You saw the results of Sandy. So Sandy happened once, it's going to happen again. We have 500, it used to have those Sandy-type storms once every 500 years. Now they're happening a lot more frequently, and will continue to. So cities like New York, uh, many around the world, London already has a storm barrier. Others have done it in the past. Um, that's, and they're looking to Holland, because they have those storm barriers, and they've, they've really made a pretty successful practice of them. And Boston, the city of Boston just finished the study. Uh, we helped contribute to some of the, the environmental assessment. They're thinking about whether or not they're evaluating whether to build a storm barrier, basically a big tidal barrier, from um, Winthrop, where the, where the wastewater treatment plant is, all the way down to Nut Island in Quincy. Again, a billion dollar project. It would be underwater most of the time, but as the storms come, may, we expect major surges, this massive mechanism would rise up and save the city. Pretty far out stuff, actually, when you think about it. But that's what, that's, that's what, we're, that's what our future is thinking of. That, I mean, that, that tells you climate change is real, and it's going to be dramatic, and we have to make some amazing adjustments and adaptations. The sooner we do it, the sooner we mitigate climate change. I haven't talked about that side, but you all know, I don't have to tell you. Right now, we better start reducing CO2 in every which way we can globally, and we are the number two emitter of carbon dioxide. We used to be number one for a long time. China's number one, we're number two. India's becoming, moving to the third place, and the European Union as a whole is at number four. So if those nations alone took dramatic steps to reduce the source of the problem, then the storm, all this discussion about storm surge barriers and everything else would be easier. Not go away, but easier. What else can, I, can we talk about? All help, all hopeful for the future. It's hard to be. It's hard to be funny about this, but I, I have to be a little bit. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great question. How how, how can what advice do I have about? countering climate change deniers. Even though I th wish and think the science is settled, you're right. There is a whole world out there, starting right from the White House, right from the top guy, 
all the way down who's denied it and will continue to forever as far as despite any amount of science and reason you can put in front of them. So we've thought about this a lot. And, and for those kinds of discussions with that segment of the population, we try to be very careful about the terminology and not use trigger words like climate change or sea level rise. But um, uh, so we, we, we try to change that a little bit. We also try to make the examples we use real everyday life. Like, did you live through Sandy if you were in New Jersey? Did you know what happened? In, hmm? Yeah. Every, so we try to just make it like practical. Have you noticed that you know the temperature is a lot hotter? That we have, you know, a lot more 90 degree days in wherever you live than we used to when you were a kid growing up. Uh, I've met with some climate change deniers in Cape Cod who happen to be realtors, and they were saying, ah, you know, they were they were doing that, prove it, Delaney. And finally, one of them said, well, you know, I remember when I was a kid and I could go down to Wakwait Bay. That's one of the inlets between Falmouth and, and Mashpee. And he said, it was clear and pure, and I could just jump in the water, there was no algae, and I could go out in the eelgrass beds and collect um, scallops. And I said, yeah, what does it look like today? He said, well, there's no eelgrass beds, no scallops, and there's a green mat of algae. And at that moment, he had an epiphany. He said, gee, even in my lifetime, I guess I've seen the change. Said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So if you can get people to kind of personalize it and live it and acknowledge it, maybe, um, even then it's hard to get that to translate into political policies and, and costs, and even harder to get people to change their behavior. Because for us to take that action, all you guys who are driving gas guzzlers, you should be driving a Prius. I mean, or riding a bike, even better. That's hard for people to change. You know, we've grown up with this stuff. One way that we could reduce our carbon dioxide intake that significantly is for the, everyone to give up eating meat one day a week. Not because it's Friday and you're Catholic and all that stuff. One day a week, if the, if the United States stopped eating meat one day a week, that means the, Arizona, the Amazon rainforest would not be cut down. That's my friend Dr. Charles Stormy Mayo calling me who's the pioneer of saving whales, but I, I, he should be speaking right here to you guys as well. He did once before. Um, but if, if we did not do that, that would take away the economic incentive to, to clear-cut rainforests in Brazil, to convert them to pastures, to grow cows, to come back and make McDonald burgers. It's literally what happens. That's the connections. You have to, that's, if you can tell that to President Trump, to every, every time you have another cheeseburger from McDonald's, that means you have to grow another cow in the Amazon. How far would you get with that? I, I, I'll stay away from the politics, but I don't have any hope for it. But that's, that's exactly, that's, he, every day, now I, I hadn't thought of that before, but every day when he does that, you know, he's famous for his McDonald's, he's, he's illustrating an easy step that he could help and the rest of us could help to reduce CO2. Okay, anything else? Well, again, thank you for your attention. If you like, I just will do one last pitch. Uh, if you do come to Cape Cod and you come to Provincetown, please come by and visit us. We'll have a, a much more modest museum than this. This is wonderful. And the partnership we've, we're developing with James and his staff here are just going to be exciting. We, he's going to help us become something a little bit better, a lot better, I hope. But come by and visit. Uh, I do have some membership brochures up here. If you, you should be a member of the Nantucket Historical Association, but you should if you like, a member of the Center for Coastal Studies. And uh, my friend Carol, um, who is over here, she has a little brochure that if you really are concerned about the right whales I talked about, we're trying to find 1,000 new friends of right whales. Grab one of those brochures. We need 1,000 people. We're asking people to maybe come up with $100 a piece. More or less would be great. But if we could raise some more money, we could extend our ability to track, rescue, and hopefully make that species survive this uh, catastrophe that they're living in right now. So again, thank you very much. Thanks, James.